Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, I think it's just, well, 1.30 my time. I'm assuming 7.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. Um, I think everybody's here who should be here. So let's kick off. And um, I'd really like to welcome you to this virtual side event on the margins of the 2022 High Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. My name is um, Stefan Kohler, and I'll be the moderator for this event this afternoon. Um, this event is going to explore the role of infrastructure asset management in ensuring that infrastructure systems are well planned and maintained to reliably serve the communities throughout their life cycle. The way the, the event has been um, structured is in, in two parts. We're going to have a part one, which is the role and importance of infrastructure asset management. Um, we will have some esteemed panelists who I shall shortly introduce to you who will uh, present some of their thoughts. And then we're going to have a part two, which is the core concepts of infrastructure asset management and examples um, and, and applications of how this is done. This event has been co-organized by UNOPS and UNDESA, and I'm very pleased to welcome our panelists for today, and I will introduce them, I think, just by name. The bios have been circulated, so in the interest of time, we will just um, introduce everybody by name. So a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Christian Roberts, who's the president of the Institute of Asset Management. We have Dr. Ajit Kumar, Parlikad, he's the head of Asset Management Group, University of Cambridge. We have Ms. Caroline Lombardo. She is the Chief International Tax and Development Cooperation Branch in the Financing for Sustainable Development Office at UNDESA. We have Mr. Nicholas O'Regan. He's the Director of Implementation Practices and Standards at UNOPS. We have Mr. Mihai Kopanyi who is the Municipal Finance Advisor with the World Bank. Uh, we have Dr. Linda Newton, who is an adjunct professor at Carleton University and president of Linda Newton Consulting. And then last but not least, uh, Ms. Sandra Diaz, who is a Senior Infrastructure and Project Management Specialist, Integrated Practice Advice and Support from UNOPS. So those are our panelists and we'll be hearing from them and their views on asset management from, from a variety of perspectives, which I hope everybody finds incredibly interesting. As we all know, infrastructure is, is the backbone of economic growth and underpins sustainable development. A recent study by UNOPS and the University of Oxford demonstrated this point, showing that infrastructure can influence the achievement of up to 92% of the sustainable development goal targets. However, we know in many developing countries, the quality of infrastructure is below par and makes the achievement of these SDG targets extremely challenging. Further, the pandemic that we've recently been through COVID has exposed our fragility, reinforcing the urgent need to repair, rethink and invest in infrastructure that will meet our needs in the challenging environment and support the achievement of the SDGs. More than ever, improved infrastructure management is needed as a catalyst for economic recovery, necessary for human development. Today's discussion will actually highlight the importance of infrastructure asset management and how it can help countries get back on track to meet the SDGs and accelerate recovery. With the help of our esteemed panelists, we hope to enhance our audience's understanding of the importance of improving infrastructure, of improved infrastructure management to maximize opportunities for economic recovery and growth and to meet the sustainable development goals. The discussion we're gonna to have today will highlight the work of various entities in this area 
and will also be a time to share lessons learned from delivering infrastructure asset management projects in collaboration with host governments. We'll move into part one of the session. Um, and this part covers the role and importance of infrastructure asset management. Um, we're going to ask our panelists for their interventions to some questions we'll be asking. Um, they roughly have about five minutes each. So in the interest of time, I'm going to ask people to please try and, and, and stick to that. Um, so the role and importance of infrastructure asset management in ensuring infrastructure systems are well planned and maintained to reliably serve communities throughout their life cycle. I think this is one of the key aspects of, of, of asset management. So the first question I'd like to pose to our panelists um, is why should the international community care about infrastructure asset management? Why is it so important? And why has it not received that much attention or visibility to date? Um, Dr. Christian Roberts, President of the Institute of Asset Management, perhaps I could ask you to give us some of your thoughts on this question. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan, and thank you for this opportunity to speak on this panel this morning, uh, this afternoon, or this evening for wherever you are. Um, so yeah, three very good questions there. And maybe just to start with answering the last question, actually, um, what we've seen over the last three decades, we've talked extensively about asset management. The global critical infrastructure communities have invested a huge number of hours, energy and effort in developing asset management capabilities. And I think we're starting to finally see governments across the globe identifying the need for asset management, even if it is just asset management planning um, as a way of allocating funding. Um, you, you say, you know, why is it not received the attention um, to date, I think it, it's not received the attention to date, it's not received the attention it deserves, um, really because a lot of those conversations that we've had around asset management have been really focused more so on managing assets. So we've been talking about day-to-day -day maintenance, we've been talking about rehabil rehabilitation. Um, we see asset management as an engineering operations and maintenance problem, and so it it doesn't get the the conversation doesn't get elevated to the the levels within an organization or the levels within government that it needs to um the the institute of asset management has been advocating for the last three decades that asset management is a lot more than just maintenance and rehabilitation it really is a focus on how we extract value from physical assets it's about ensuring that the activities that we, we perform in an organization um, are fully aligned to the agency or the corporate mission. And it really is about ensuring that we've got alignment between the investments in those assets, as well as the, um, the alignment in the investment in those assets, the physical equipment, um, to really helping to maximize the success of the organization. I have an example I've used. I've used it a few times. I use it because it's quite simple to get your head around. Um, and that is, you know, we manage the asset to deliver a service. So if you think about a rail and bus service, for example, it's an easy one to get your head around, as I said. Um, when we're managing the assets, we're really focusing on delivering that service in a safe, efficient and reliable way. Asset management is helping us to focus the decisions that we're making not just considering service output, so not just thinking about maintenance reliability, for example, but really focusing on service outcome. So thinking about how we would connect a disadvantaged community to employment opportunities, to healthcare, and to education on a broader scale. And I think that starts to demonstrate why it's important. You picked up something in your opening remark, and I, and I just want to put a, another little bit of colour on this. Uh, another bit of context of why it is important. Since 1980, China has invested 8% of its gross domestic product in infrastructure, in domestic infrastructure. This compares to, say, the US, who's, who has invested 1% um, during the same period. And what we've seen in China between 1980 and 2015 is a decline in poverty of around 94%, which when you compare that to the US with little to no decline, it does start to tell 
a very telling picture of the, the, the role of infrastructure in addressing some of those social equity issues. We, we are now at the beginning of a, a decade of growth in infrastructure across the globe. The, the, the pandemic has driven all sorts of new thinking around infrastructure. You know, we, we've got this, uh, this uh, urge, this need to partially build our way out of um, an economic downturn. Um, but we're also recognizing that the value drivers for infrastructure have shifted. Um, we're no longer just focused on maintenance and reliability. We're no longer just focused on the economic value of infrastructure and how it drives jobs, regional growth, etc. We're also focused more so now on the societal value. We think about well-being, we think about social equity, and we think about the connectivity between infrastructure and social equity. Um, we're also thinking about long-term value. We're focused on climate resilience and sustainability. And from a recovery standpoint, we're no longer just talking about shovel-ready projects, which has always been the case when we start to think about using um, investments in infrastructure to build our way out of, of a downturn. We're now talking about shovel-worthy projects. And that requires us to really focus on the asset management piece, the how do we extract value from our physical assets. That leads me to your first question, which is why should the international community care about infrastructure asset management? A bit of a mouthful there. Um, we, across the globe, we've seen an unprecedented record amount of infrastructure deficit that has just built up over decades of underfunding in infrastructure. And that, that's it's not just a Western world. I mean, that's across the entire globe. Um, we've got roads and bridges and everything collapsing and in, in, in all part, all corners of the world. Um, we've also experienced over the last few years, and I think the last two years in particular on record, um, some of the worst weather-related disasters. Um, it's, a, we're, it's a recognition, I think. It's a, we've all reached that conclusion that climate change is now having a very detrimental impact on our infrastructure. So we've now got this recognized urgency that we have to address asset resilience. This is not something that is going to handle itself through state of good repair type um, investments in infrastructure. We've got to build it back. We've got to build it back at an increased level of performance to address that asset resilience. Of course, we've also acknowledged, finally, I think, that greenhouse gases are the single biggest contributor to climate change. Um, and with 70% of the world's carbon coming from infrastructure, um, how we address this, how we address the reduction in, in greenhouse gases, how we how we march forward on the path to net zero really comes down to how we're going to manage our assets, our infrastructure asset management programs. So we've all recognized that these things are now in play. I think the, the, the one other thing that is worth throwing out there, which is more from a corporate rather than government, but government benefit from it, of course, is there is a, a global recognition that um, those organizations that are environmentally, and socially responsible and have strong ethical governance frameworks in place. Um, the ESG agenda, as we're seeing it, is now it's now very widespread. And we recognize that those organizations are generally a lot more successful than those that do not consider that. So in the last two years, we've seen a huge increase in sustainable investment strategies, um, tapping into you know, over $53 trillion of uh, investor funding that is being pumped into um, sustainable sustainable opportunities. So, so I think you know this this is why the international community should care. It is about addressing today's problems, but it's also about laying this foundation for intergenerational equity. You know, we we have a responsibility to leave the world in a place which others can thrive and survive. And that I think is why we need to start thinking about asset management in terms of the long-term and how we continue to extract value from those assets and not just managing asset in terms of the short-term, will I be able to get my bus or train um, delivering a service today? I'll uh, turn the floor back to the moderator, thank you. Thank you very much. Um... 
Dr. Roberts, some, some very interesting and very pertinent insights. Um, and I hope is going to spark some, some discussions and questions from, from the floor. Uh, and just on that, please, if people have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, and we have people from UNOPS who are supporting who will uh, make a note of those questions and we will try and uh, address your questions as we go along. Um, we do have one of our panelists who unfortunately will have to leave us shortly. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Ajit Kumar Parlikad, who's the head of the Asset Management Group at the University of Cambridge. Um, Dr. Parlikad, you are also the lead instructor for the UN Institute of Asset Management Initiative on capturing and utilizing data for asset management. Uh, could you just elaborate for us a little bit more on three interrelated questions? Um, the first one is, why is data important for asset management? What are the common challenges local governments encounter when they collect data for asset management? And how can these challenges be overcome in a resource constrained environment? Thank you, Dr. Parlikant. Thank you, Stefan. Um, um, uh, Chris uh, uh, put um, the, the, the whole concept of asset management very beautifully, and uh, that, that sets a good scene for me to talk about data. So, so as Chris mentioned, um, asset management is about um, managing the value that is delivered by our physical assets in the context of um, economic outcomes, in the context of societal outcomes, and getting good uh, environmental and sustainable outcomes as well. Um, and 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 what we do in asset management is carry out a set of activities and make a set of decisions that drive towards these uh, strategic um, objectives for for the government for the for the the municipalities for the councils um, and so on in order to make any of these decisions uh, or carry out any of these activities properly you need data you need to understand what your assets are where are they located? What is it worth? What its what its condition is, and so on and so forth. We are not really talking about all the fancy analytics and data analytics and so on that we talk about these days. We are in a digital era. We are swamped with data in in many organizations, but that's not what we are talking about. If you don't have the basic set of data about your assets, you will not be able to carry out the activities and make decisions in an effective manner to to, to drive those strategic objectives um, forward. So, for for, for instance. If you don't know what the condition of your assets are, how your roads are degrading over time, you wouldn't know what, how much money to spend on what assets at what time. So you would not be able to plan your investment properly. You would not be able to create your budgets effectively. If you don't know how many users and what type of users are using your infrastructure, you wouldn't know which roads are, for, for instance, more important than others. So if you have many things that you need to do with a limited budget that you have, without that good data about the assets and the use of those assets and linking them to the outcomes that Chris was talking about, you would basically be doing guesswork or you would be investing money where people shout the loudest. So if you have good data that really helps you identify and fix problems before they cause these, these, uh, uh, these disruptions, but also better data about your assets that they lead to better decisions and better value for money. So whatever investment you're actually making, you can be ensured that they actually meet those objectives that, that the government wants to have in the long term, short term, as well as in the long term. And also when you're making these decisions about investing in your assets, Better data provides you with better justification. It's not based on guesswork. It's not based on who has the most uh, political power or who shouts the loudest. It is based on evidence. And that gives you a lot of confidence in, in doing what you're doing in terms of asset management. Next slide, please. So hopefully that, that makes it clear why having asset data is important, but then it's it's not easy. There are lots of challenges that I've seen um, working with a number of companies uh, in the UK as well as in other parts of the world. And the primary thing is about data quality. It's it's hard to have good quality data about your assets, that, uh, data that is um, that reflects your assets accurately, reflects um, um, the, the condition of your assets, data, you might have data, but that is not accessible to the right decision makers at the right time. So having good quality data is really important. Otherwise, you, you end up 
either making mistakes in your decisions or you don't trust the data. So you go about collecting the data again. So a lot of effort is wasted. But then again, um, collecting and managing good asset data takes effort and commitment. And often the problem is that people who are responsible for gathering this data see that as a cumbersome activity. They want to go in, uh, fix the problems and get out. They don't want to be filling out forms. So that's that's a, that's a real issue that we see in, in gathering good data. Um, and one of the reasons why people don't do this, this effectively is because they don't actually know why they're doing what they're doing. If they're collecting data, if they're updating the records and so on, is anyone actually using this? And in many organizations we see these days, they are swamped with data, but they don't actually use the data that they, um, they, they have. So using the data that you have is really important for actually making these effective decisions, but also affecting motivation of the people who are actually responsible for collecting data. And there are organizational cultural issues. It's, it's a change management. It's a, it's a different way of managing your assets with the data as opposed to guesswork and um, fix when, when things fail kind of a, a culture that we always have. So there's that, that needs, that's, that's a hindrance and that needs to be changed. And there are legal issues as well. Um, it's like people closing their eyes and imagining, okay, it's all dark around me, it's all fine. Um, what I don't know, I don't need to be responsible for. So um, perhaps that's also a, a hindrance for collecting data. And last but not least, skills. Um, our, our organizations are filled with good people and, and good people who understand their assets, engineers and so on. But when it comes to data and data management, perhaps we lack those appropriate skills. Next, sli next slide, please. So in, 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 to, in, in order to address these challenges, some, some key messages here, and they're, they're not um, super hard to, to comprehend. It's the basic change management um, lesson here top management commitment. Uh, the, uh, uh, we're talking about infrastructure, so highest political and bureaucratic levels. They need to understand the value of data and they need to com show commitment. And um, when you're faced with a resource constraint situation, it's important to get the basics right, not start a, straight away jump into the most complicated asset management system and asset information system, data, data systems and so on. Get the basics right, understand your assets and their condition, don't overcomplicate. Well, it's important to address that skills issue, get the right in team involved and, and, and give them the right responsibility and authority in order to manage that data. I said about um, um, I'm not overcomplicating, so it is about using low cost, easy to use systems to begin with. And, and if, you, if you have a systematic approach in, in identifying your assets and the asset hierarchy and so on, this will fall in place. And as, you mature, as organizations mature in terms of uh, their ability to gather and use data, you can then start thinking about uh, more complicated systems. Um, and again, going back to the change management issue and motivation issue, demonstrate benefits early with some quick wins and, and some success stories. So now we've started collecting this data. We can do this better. We saved some money. We, we fixed problems before they, they, they occurred. So we have better infrastructure now. And finally, motivation and training of staff. Again, going back to that skills issue. And that's, that's increasingly in today's world, skills and getting people, staff shortages, it's affecting all organizations. I'll stop there, um, hand, hand the floor back to you, Stefan. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Parlikad. Yeah, very interesting what you said about data and change management. One comment I would have is I have had this discussion with people who think an asset management system is a database. Um, we know that's not the case. So um, maybe we can explore that a little bit more when we, when we get to the, to the questions. Um, I'm going to give the floor to Ms. Caroline Lombardo, who's the Chief International Tax and Development Corporation, the branch in the Financing for Sustainable Development Office at UNDESA. Um, Ms. Lombardo is also an editor of the UN Handbook on Infrastructure Asset Management. Um, Ms. Lombardo, I'd like you to return to the bigger picture of infrastructure asset management and the SDGs. And the questions we pose is, why should government in the developing and developed world care about infrastructure asset management during these times of multiple crises? And the second part of the question is, 
What is the UN doing to help countries around the world to manage their infrastructure more sustainably? Thank you, over to you, Caroline. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stefan, and to our panelists so far, and to participants for joining us today. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you all and, and to welcome you to this joint UN-DESA UNAP side event on infrastructure asset management's role in a sustainable, inclusive, resilient recovery from COVID-19. HLPF is gathering to galvanize momentum to build back better, and this challenge of strengthening resilience and sustainability of infrastructure is really high on the global agenda. As you mentioned, Stefan, the world is grappling with multiple crises from COVID to climate change, inflation, debt distress, conflicts that have sent food prices soaring. So as we come together at the UN to tackle these challenges, I welcome this question. How can we heed the very important lessons learned about the importance of more inclusive, resilient, localized infrastructure for crisis preparedness, for reducing risk and building resilience. So three lessons this morning. First, access to infrastructure must become more inclusive and equitable because when it breaks, it's the most vulnerable segments of the population, the poor, women, children, persons with disabilities that suffer the most. Second, Infrastructure systems must become more adaptive. They need that to be effective as first line of defense against increased flooding, heat, wildfires, hurricanes, other disasters that we all know are increasing in frequency due to climate change. Third, we increasingly understand the local dimension of infrastructure and the challenges that come with that. Local governments across the globe are confronted with tough decisions about how to utilize limited public services and infrastructure that they rely on heavily during times of crisis. So to the second part of your question, UN system, including UN DESA, UN CDF, UNOPS, is responding to these mounting challenges through a capacity development initiative on infrastructure asset management, what we call IAM. And the UN IAM initiative is targeting both local and national governments in developing countries. And importantly, it's an integral piece of the wider financing for sustainable development agenda. And it's very much driven by local needs and contexts. The objective is simple, but ambitious at the same time. What we're doing is trying to maximize financial and service value of current and future investments in infrastructure over their entire life cycle and for generations to come. It's a very simple approach focused on peer learning, organizational change, improved standards and practices, and it encourages small investments and the kind of sustained commitment that you've heard our panelists talking about that leads to large payoffs in the future. And the last portion, of course, is looking at innovative approaches taken across the globe. We have been looking, for example, at some ingenious initiatives in Kuala Lumpur with smart tunnels where traffic tunnels are built with multifunctionality and have been used for stormwater management during intense storms or cities that have shared mobile assets to reduce costs and, and maintenance responsibilities. So most importantly, it's not a prescriptive initiative. It's really a platform for mutual learning and dialogue between asset managers and the very different layers of government and local communities involved. And so to work effectively, it really needs to be embedded in that enabling institutional and regulatory environment. So following today's event, I would encourage all of you to look at the many uh, resources that are available for free on the UN website that have been produced by the partners over the last five years or so, starting with our UN handbook on IAM. It's available now in 10 languages. There's also a free certifiable, massive open online course on IAM on the website as well as a global repository of the action plans being put together at local level. There are over 150 action plans up now where you can view them to um, gain information and insights from others' experiences. So please engage with us at UNDESA and our partners in CDF and UNOPS. We're here for you. Let us know how we can help. Thank you so much and looking forward to today's further discussions. Back to you, Stefan. Thank you, Caroline. Um, thank you, yes, for those uh, inspiring remarks. And personally, I have been involved in some of the joint efforts, and I think it's great to see that the agencies coming together on this really important topic. 
uh, and, and sharing our expertise, resources, experience. I think it's, it's, it's a great initiative. Thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to turn to um, Mr. Nicholas Regan, who's the Director of Implementation Practices and Standards um, at UNOPS. Um, and the questions I'm going to pose to Nick is, um, Nick, with, with UNOPS's infrastructure mandate, could you please discuss and share some of your thoughts on why infrastructure and more specifically infrastructure asset management will be critical for achieving the SDGs, climate action and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic? Thanks, Nick, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Stefan. And thanks to the panelists for the uh, really informative and interesting uh, intervention so far. Uh, I guess the short answer is, uh, is infrastructure is, is, is really central to our lives and central to our future. Um, but maybe a longer answer is, um, is basically that infrastructure touches every aspect of human life, from the roads that we drive on, uh, the mobile networks that connect us to the deliver of water that we drink and the electricity that lights up our homes. It connects people with services, provides opportunities and protects lives and livelihoods. And in fact, uh, research that we did together with the University of Oxford shows that infrastructure influences 92% of all targets across the sustainable development goals. Uh, the research also showed that uh, infrastructure is responsible for 79% of all greenhouse gas emissions and will be responsible for 88% of all adaptation costs. It's therefore at the center of efforts to achieve sustainable development, as well as to address climate change mitigation and adaptation. And infrastructure has a profound impact on gender equality and inclusion from schools with adequate toilets for girls to safe roads and transport systems, adequate health facilities, and gender inclusive infrastructure saves women's lives and facilitates their access to education, to work, and to other opportunities. And if we need any further reminding, then the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted how crucial infrastructure is to the smooth functioning of our society. It's revealed how unequipped our world's infrastructure is to deal with a shock of this magnitude. And as countries look to the future and our recovery from the pandemic, infrastructure needs to be at the heart of sustainable, resilient, and inclusive recovery. Now, infrastructure asset management provides a means to achieve the above benefits by managing the infrastructure assets for both present and future generations in a way that meets community needs in this really changing and complex world. For example, infrastructure asset management can uh, support climate mitigation by helping governments identify the greatest sources of carbon emissions uh, within their infrastructure systems so that systematic changes can be made to reduce them and for them to achieve their nationally determined contribution targets. Uh, furthermore, the most sustainable option available to governments to reduce emissions is to extend the life of existing infrastructure by improving the maintenance, by refurbishing old assets and protecting them from a changing climate. This will reduce the need for new construction and their carbon emissions. And frankly, better performing infrastructure can also reduce technical losses to prevent unnecessary waste and, uh, and, and the financial losses that come with that. Um, also, Good asset management practices include identifying whether even a new asset is even needed at all. There might be an alternative demand uh, mechanism that can be used to change uh, the demand, such as road tariffs or nature-based solutions, such as mangroves to reduce erosion and uh, storm surges instead of the construction of seawalls. Um, inadequate infrastructure maintenance has long been recognized as a challenge by the World Bank. Failure to maintain physical infrastructure has led to its premature deterioration around the world in what is sometimes referred to as the build, neglect, and rebuild cycle. And frankly, in the, re in the reality of, uh, of limited financing to address the immense infrastructure investment needs for government to realize the SDGs and to tackle climate action, every dollar counts and we cannot afford to, to get it wrong. So, Infrastructure asset management uh, practices can also increase communities' resilience to the impacts of a changing climate and improve response to disasters through scenario planning and identifying which assets may fail if a specific event occurs. 
so that preparations can be made ahead of time to reduce response needs, to save lives, as well as to recover faster. Uh, inclusive infrastructure improves the quality of people's lives uh, and facilitates equal access to education, health, and work. And infrastructure management processes can actually be used to identify which assets do not equally serve the entire community. Uh, for example, access ramps or larger toilets for the disabled and elderly, or helping to ensure that women and girls are able to access services safely. So it's important for the United Nations to work in partnership with governments to enhance their capacity to improve the quality, the performance, and the value of their infrastructure systems while minimizing the life cycle costs and risks. Uh, and again, to meet both present and the future needs for all. Uh, now, UNOPS has a central mandate in infrastructure and we support our partners to address these infrastructure challenges. And together with our partners, such as the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs, we're supporting governments to deliver on their development goals by helping them to manage their infrastructure assets and systems more effectively, as well as more efficiently. Uh, and uh, just to end, it's, 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 it's evident that sustainable, resilient and inclusive infrastructure is a key element uh, for a better future. So uh, thank you and back to you, Stefan. Thank you very much, Nick, um, for, for a good and a great detailed response. I think um, highlighting some very important points. We, we are actually at a crucial moment in time, um, you know, for a better future, accelerating investments in infrastructure, asset management is, is going to be key. Uh, just a couple of points, you know, that I would like us to sort of think a little bit more about. Uh, and from what we've just heard from our speakers before we move into the, the second part of the session, um, and we will get to, to, to questions, um, so if people could just keep asking or putting them in, in the chat. Um, I think some of the things that came out of this, this discussion for me that were interesting, just a few highlights, um, that, you know, asset management, I think, shifts our focus from just as um, Dr. Robert said, from the operations and maintenance to thinking more about the outcomes that we want to achieve and, and, and the service outcomes that we want from infrastructure and how do we ensure that the infrastructure actually delivers the services that, that we need. Um, and it's about the value that we achieve from, from those assets. Dr. Um, Badlick obviously talked about data as being really important. And I think a key point that he made was using the data to make good decisions, which needs good data. And I think we've seen this in many instances where institutions do not have good data. They're making decisions about investing in infrastructure based on poor data. I think if we want to achieve the value that we want from our assets, we really need to have good data to do that. Um, and, and people need to understand why they're collecting this data. It's not just for the sake of, of collecting it. Um, from Caroline, I think also, again, what, what came out quite strongly um, is, is our infrastructure is so important because when it does fail, it's the most vulnerable that invariably suffer the most. Um, and it's the people on the ground at local level where the impact is felt the most. So if we don't effectively manage those assets, those are the people that are gonna be, be mostly impacted by, by damage to, to, to the assets. And also we need to be more adaptable. You know, the world is changing, climate is changing. Uh, we can't have a sort of a linear fixed thinking about our assets. We need to be more creative in the way we think about that. Um, and I think then, you know, Nick reiterated and highlighted a lot of those aspects um, clearly the fact that 92% of the SDG targets are, are influenced or impacted by infrastructure just shows how important this really is. And, and a lot of the impacts we don't often consider about infrastructure, that it can um, perpetuate gender inequalities, it can perpetuate vulnerabilities in society, it can perpetuate things like climate change. So we really need to think carefully about that. And, and a point that Nick also touched on, which is quite close to my heart, is we are often fixated on creating new assets. 
What about non-asset solutions? What about nature-based solutions? Using what we already have or using our assets more effectively rather than always continually creating new assets. So I think some really important points for us to, to reflect on. So I'd like to move on to the second part of our discussion, which is around the core concepts of infrastructure asset management and example of how these have been applied. Um, so my next question that I'm going to pose to our panelists is, how can we advance infrastructure asset management in the developing world? And here I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Mihai Kopanyi, the Municipal Finance Advisor from the World Bank to share some of his reflections on this. Uh, Mihai, over to you, thank you. Is Mihai still with us? May I, so, you're still muted. Thank you, you're unmuted. Go ahead, please. Well, you were unmuted. I think you're still on mute, Mihai. Uh, good morning. Uh, I you. was wondering whether uh, you see my slides. Okay, okay. Next. Next slide, please. I like to talk about four points uh, to add to this discussion, and specifically from the perspective of, of uh, cities or local governments, rather than more broad. Next, guys. The first issue is that in the developing world, cities still don't have asset management framework. They do have some little bits and pieces, mostly in, in silos. Uh, so one, the first issue is we need to have them set up asset management framework which often to avoid a big and complex uh, ICT uh, system, Rwanda spent uh, three, four years uh, to develop a system from an ICT perspective, got nowhere in three years. The next issue is uh, they need to have a good inventory of the uh, fixed assets. However, the people, in the daily work, they don't have time. So cities need to hire a consulting firm and maybe the central government need to provide an asset register fund for the cities to help them finance uh, the uh, uh, developing a good, reliable asset inventory. They should focus on land and building and leave the other little items uh, uh, for a future work. Second, the cities need to adopt asset management policies together with the liabilities. Interestingly, we need to focus very much on liabilities, not only the assets for strategic perspective. In the policy, they need to set mandates, responsibilities, chain of command and standard operations procedure. These are the missing elements. They need to postpone valuation at the beginning. The first is to have a good, uh, reliable in, in inventory and maybe some simplified uh, valuation. And as already been mentioned, it is critical to train staff and to insource a few critical positions, as also mentioned, some good analytic capacity to know what to analyze regarding the assets, including demand assessment, uh, including uh, performance assessment. Next, please. The next area, uh, we need to have cities promote strategic development. In the post-pandemic era, they need to revise the old development plans. In many countries, the plans are five years and fixed and not followed at all. They need to revise the, the plan and reprioritize development project. Second, we need to help promote capital improvement planning, medium term planning based on data. First, to curb political motivated projects, very common in many countries. I have worked in about 40, 30 countries. We should help them integrate low carbon CIP into urban planning and development. We 
need to warn, avoid mega project at this time with long gestation and long uh, return period. A refurbishment may be more beneficial. It's just mentioned by, by Richard. Uh, then building new assets. They start and complete faster, smaller in size and more visible improvement. Next, please. The next aspect is we need to help cities expanding the fiscal space for development. First is they need to target grants for, for development to follow a clever policy. We need to help cities, however, to tap into the international climate funds. For that, they need good project, good implementation, good reporting capacities. They don't have. Without that, they will not uh, reach the fund. Second, they might need a national recovery program and to make sure that this recovery is not only central government projects, but really provided down to the local governments and to the communities. Uh, land value capture is another good source to expand the fiscal pace. However, there are no practices and there are often uh, political resistance like I experienced in Rwanda. No one wanted to talk about even a land value capture, not, not uh, using it. The second is to use the assets well. They need to revise rent, lease, and PPP contract and look after return on, on assets to know what, what is this asset uh, is, is, is working and really provide money or not. Uh, second, they need to reduce wasteful expenses. They need to revise subsidies. Many is formal or informal. Informal, for instance, when the municipality just pays the electricity of the water company, the huge amount, and even it is not accounted as a water expenditure, just as an electricity in general. So PUCs or municipal department uh, uh, eat up operating surpluses in India, Kenya, Turkey. I have e enormous number of examples for that. Uh, instead of blunt subsidization, they need to perform performance-based subsidization to make it as a default. Second, control revenue generation projects and ex uh, analyze what is the return. For instance, why do you like to build a, an office building for rental when there is no water for the people? So there, are, but these are political motivated issues sometimes. So we need to change that. Next, please. The final issue I like to highlight is that there are issues in budgeting, accounting, and financial reporting. The most striking and most important is the classification of revenues and expenditures, which today, most of the cases do not reflect the asset performance correctly. So we need to help and change the classification in many cases to segregate clearly operating and development and financing budget, to measure clearly the cost of operation by key services and functions to ensure clear planning, accounting, and reporting of capital and operating uh, subsidies. As I told, if it is not measured, you don't really know uh, what is the, the volume, what is the magnitude, the gravity of, of subsidies. We need to help breaking up the general expenditure line of operation and maintenance. Instead, we need to reflect very specifically how much is spent on repair and maintenance? Someone, Christian told that it is uh, too much focus on, on repair and maintenance sometimes. No, cities, particularly after the COVID, spent very tiny amount of repair and maintenance. And most of the cases only reactive maintenance. This means they replace something that it is totally broken down. So we need to put the repair and maintenance into the strategic management of, of assets in a life cycle format. And finally, the donor community need to help cities to provide them with benchmarking, financial ratios. For instance, what is the good percentage you could expect from the operational budget to spend on, on repair and maintenance? Or what is a good percentage to spend on development from the total budget? Uh, different kind of asset performance benchmarks. 
and then the cities can measure and report performance against the benchmark. Thank you, and I give the floor back uh, to David. Thank you. Thank you, Mihai, for some very, very interesting perspectives. And I think what I'm seeing is clearly this is, as the word says, asset management being the key thing. There are a number of management issues in there and some very practical examples uh, of what needs to be done to address those. And perhaps when we have questions, we can explore those uh, a little further. Um, Following on from that, this leads us to another critical question for the panel. Um, and I'm going to ask Dr. Linda Newton, who's the adjunct professor at Carleton University and president of Linda Newton Consulting to perhaps address this question. Um, Linda, in your experience in the field as a leading authority on infrastructure asset management, how can we make a compelling case for infrastructure asset management? I know that's a huge question. Um, but uh, perhaps some thoughts, Linda, over to you. Thank you, Stefan. And uh, could we um, put the slide deck up, please? So I think it, it is a question that I've struggled with my entire career. You know, how do we make this compelling case for asset management? And it's one of our biggest challenges. That, uh, you know, our panelists so far have eloquently talked about the key elements of asset management, but in both my consulting work and my teaching work and, and now on the UN DESA project, I've so often found that many organizations think asset management is just about simply finance, having an asset register and paying for stuff. And, and so you know, they know what they have and what it's worth, which is those first two of the six fundamental asset management questions that you may have seen if you've um, been part of any of our workshops or, or looked at the book but they just don't get the basics, like they don't get it. And so why is this? You know, we're going back on our project, we've expanded our project this year and we're going back to um, several other countries. And this is going to be the foundation of what I'm talking about. We need to do a better job of relating all of these concepts we've talked about today to something people understand. And so the best way we do that is to explain it in terms of personal things. It was in a car, it's a motorbike. So we have to personalize asset management first that people can internalize what it is we mean. Next slide, please. So let's talk about that motorbike, right? What can we learn from our motorbike? What can we learn from our personal things? Well, we all have personal things that, um, that we have in our daily lives. And why do we need these things? You know, they give us shelter, food, you know, transportation. And we need to convey that message that these personal things are things that we care about. You know, and these things then are what we call assets. And we have to do something with these assets. What are those services that they deliver? We talk about your know, shelter, food, transportation. What are those things that we need to get those services? Hence my motorbike, your transportation. So if we get people thinking about this and go, oh, okay, well, what does that mean? Next slide, please. And so now we've got them thinking about personal assets. And then we get them thinking about how do they look after those assets? Um, and these are all going to be new slides that we'll be using in our, in our workshops from here on in. You know, we, we get to think about those many questions we have. Ajit, Dr. Palikar put up several questions, many questions that we need to think about. And so if we simplify them into sort of half a dozen here, you know, we start to think about, we have to plan for assets and then we acquire them and then we use them. And then at some point we get rid of them. And when we start that planning, you know, you say to people, well, if you have a motorbike, how many do you need? Do you need one motorbike? Do you need two? Do you need one car? Two cars. And how long do you need it for? And then once you've made that decision, how are you going to get it? And how are you going to pay for it? And then we move on to, well, you've got that sorted. You've now got your motorbike. How are you going to look after it? What do you need to do? So I call this some um, asset management, teaching asset management by stealth. Okay? We're getting people to think about what they do in their daily lives without actually getting into the really, um, the, the academic aspects of asset management, if you like. And so we go through these, you know, let's go through these basic questions and ask people these questions, because the answers to these are what we need to know to manage our assets so that they'll provide those personal services that, um, that we've looked at. Next slide, please. Then we can make that connection and say, now let's talk about the public domain. You have personal things, which we call personal assets, well, in the public domain, we have public things that we call public assets. And these public assets provide a public service. 
So when we talk about infrastructure asset management, we can now make that connection to show people that it's about managing those public things so they continue to provide the service we need to meet our public needs, and then ultimately the SDGs, which is what we've also been talking about here today. So how do we make that compelling case for asset management? I think we have to focus on creating a basic awareness and understanding that at some level, we're all mass, we are all asset managers. And I, I'm, I'll see how well this works when we go back out to the field, but certainly this has worked with my students. And, um, and I think that is the biggest challenge is so that people will get it. What is that personal connection? Why is asset, perhaps the question we need to be asking is, you know, not just why do I care about asset management, but why is it relevant to me? Thank you. And I'll now turn the floor back to Stefan. Hopefully that raises some interesting uh, questions. Thank you, Linda. And, and yes, I, I think a very interesting approach and uh, I'll, I'll be following that quite closely. And I've used perhaps similar kind of approaches when discussing this with, with development partners, you know, and I get the question, how much does it cost to build a hospital? And I say to them, that's the wrong question. How much does it cost to own and operate the hospital over its entire life? You know, I say to people, mm, I could probably afford to buy a Ferrari, but I can't afford to own it. I can't pay the insurance. I can't pay the fuel and everything else that goes with it. So when you personalize it, I think it does make a, a, a big difference um, to get people to understand those concepts. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to ask our last panelist, um, Sandra Diaz, um, she is the Senior Infrastructure and Project Management Specialist at the Integrated Practice and Advice Support in UNOPS. Um, Sandra, with, with UNOPS's um, mandate for infrastructure, uh, UNOPS is committed to building a more sustainable, resilient and inclusive future for all. Could you please perhaps um, tell us or talk to us about how UNOPS supports its partners with infrastructure asset management. Thank you, Sandra, over to you. Thank you, Stefan. So if someone can please share the slides. In the meantime, we'll hi everyone. And thank you for showing your interest in, in asset management, and of course, for staying until the last presentation. I hope you can uh, bear with us and stay until the end of the session. So uh, thank you also to my UNOP colleagues for inviting me to talk about some practical examples of how we support our partners within asset management. Next slide, please. So infrastructure for any country is the central pillar for sustainable resilience and inclusive development. And it is a critical asset for protecting the lives and livelihoods of people. So as mentioned by our previous panelists, there are many challenges associated with using asset management to support a sustainable inclusive and resilient recovery from hazards like COVID-19, for example. Next slide, please. So UNOX, uh, what we do, we, we provide support, cross-cutting uh, support to partners to address challenges of achieving development objectives and putting in place effective asset management systems. These include improving their ability to plan, deliver, and manage infrastructure assets. The overall purpose of these interventions is to meet all present and future community needs. So linking uh, what we build, what we manage, what we plan to what it deliver. So today I'm gonna to speak very briefly about two projects that I implemented with UNOPS supporting our partners in this area. So please, next slide. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to be the team leader for the National Resilient Program with UNOPS in Bangladesh. So as part of a multi-country and multi-agency program within UNOPS, we provided the technical support to the local engineering department, NGED, to develop an asset management system aligned with the uh, ISO 55000. Next slide, please. So the asset management system that we developed focus on using a demand-driven and level of service approach to deliver services to people. It included the development of an asset management policy, a strategic asset management plan, asset management plans for road and bridges, an asset information strategy, and a professional development plan and strategy. So as a starting point, 
the engagement process focused on the key stakeholders within the AGED leadership to ensure that there was a good understanding of what an asset management system is, so the organization will own the system. Next slide, please. So as the foundation for the organizational transformation that we were looking for, we use a co-creation approach through a process of collaboration and capacity building around resilient infrastructure systems. This was done through the establishment of working groups with key officials from different departments within LGED and specialists from UNOPS to co-create all the strategic plans. We adopted this approach to ensure that uh, there was buy-in and support from the senior leadership to integrate the asset management system at the core of the organization, which it was our end goal for the project. So the initial LGD's expectation, as it's been mentioned in early, uh, and it happens uh, many times, is that our partners will think that uh, we're gonna do something digital or build a database for them. So however, uh, engaging uh, with LGED, working together and implementing a targeted training program within the whole organization, what we got was the LGED top management to realize that the asset management system is not a software or a database, but it is rather about conducting businesses in a new way by improving its processes, processes and systems. So mainly bringing a cultural change within the organization. So to summarize, we supported the LGD to develop a tailored and practical asset management framework connecting organizational and national priorities. And this in the long term uh, will support LGD in achieving resilience outcomes by building an inclusive, safe and sustainable asset portfolio. So please, next slide. So if we now fly quickly to Uganda, uh, in 2018, during my time as a country manager, uh, UNOP supported the work program conducting an assessment of the rural road network in several regions of Uganda. As you can see in the images when it rains in Uganda, as in many other parts of the world, it gets very, very muddy and it does create uh, great challenges to people. So you can, for example, imagine a mother who, who is going in a motorbike to deliver a kid and has to be struggling just to keep herself on a motorbike through these roads to get to a maternity center. So next slide, please. So what we did, uh, we used the Rural Access Index developed by the World Bank to map rural roads and population, but we also added the mapping of hospitals, school and markets to get the proportion of the population that had access to basic services through the whole year, including during those seasons that we just seen. Next slide, please. So this enabled an evidence-based supporting the prioritization of small and large scale interventions, but at the end to improve the road network and address the factors limiting people access to critical services. We use an on the job training approach with the district engineers uh, so they could replicate this exercise in the future to inform their annual plan. And in doing so, UNOPS supported the government of Uganda, prioritizing infrastructure investment, asset management improvement works, based on evidence and need, and finally showing the percentage of the population that had access to basic services like health, education, or markets. So next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, as a community of professionals looking for change, we must double our efforts to support our governments to improve their asset management, ensuring that everyone has access to quality services to meet their basic needs. This is critical nowadays. So this is even becoming more critical with the impact of several hazards at the moment. It could be COVID, it can be a heat wave, uh, many. Where resilient infrastructure properly managed is key to ensure continuity of services for all. It is only then through this type of support and collaboration that we will be able to achieve SDGs, win the fight against climate change and face ongoing and future challenges. Thank you very much for listening and Stefan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra. And uh, two very nice examples and sort of case studies of, of, of practical applications 
of um, the concept of, of asset management. That was the, the last question from sort of my side for, for the panelists for today. Um, I hope that the responses from the panelists and some of the questions have sparked some thinking um, and that you have some thoughts, questions that you would like to ask. So we're going to open the floor to people to ask any questions. I know some people have been putting some questions in the chat. You can either put questions in the chat or you can raise your hand uh, in the Zoom function. We'll try and get the order of this right so those that raise their hand first can, can be addressed first. Um, so we're going to proceed to the first round of questions. Um, some of them have been written, so I'll take those first and then um, I might pick on or if any of the panelists would volunteer to respond to some of the questions. Um, there was a question from the Ministry of Rural Development, but I think that's more a technical question on if people are happy for us to share the presentations. Um, and, and we can we can do that. Uh, we can ask the panelists if, if they're willing to share that. Um, the first question that has come through from Zaman Tariq, who is from the Bangladesh Municipal Development Fund, who says, no doubt asset management is an important part for preparing investment plans so that we can finance the infrastructure development projects. But there needs to be capacity building at municipality level. Being a government entity, a BMDF, how can they contribute in capacity building for HR at municipality level for asset management? Uh, in this case, they're looking for support from government as well as other international organizations like DESA or UNOPS, Institute of um, Asset Management. Um, so that's the first part of the question. There is a second part of the question, which is um, the importance of data management at the local level, um, but there needs to be HR capacity to, to manage the data. So I'm not sure if any of the panelists would volunteer to address this issue of um, contributing to capacity building for HR at, at municipality level. Mihai, did you want to jump in? Yes, I think uh, this is a, a core issue and uh, I have uh, two, two points to make to this. One is that uh, there are two different level of capacity building. One is to convince, that means to convince the highest decision makers uh, that about the importance of strategic management of assets. That could be uh, maybe a sort of sensitizing uh, workshop or discussion on dialogue. We did it in, in Kenya with, with a quite good success, uh, uh, I, can, I can say. The second is for the technical. As I said, as soon as there are reasonable asset management framework and system established, there is important to have very specific target training of the staff, including, as I said, they might need to hire some additional stuff for, for good, for instance, analytic purposes. But these trainings are often basically mismanaged because instead of training, they have a kind of workshop without any commitment, without any uh, specific uh, uh, targeted results. What need to be done, I would say, and as, as an old professor, that there would need to be a certification training very specific training, maybe different training for, for different groups of, of people who are responsible for the asset management. And uh, with a closing exam to make sure that they are really trained instead of spending three, four, five days in a good, good discussion and, and good coffee breaks. I think this is, this is the area. First, there is a need a system and according to the system, specific training to the people. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mihai. Look, I, I agree with you. I think what you know, I think one of the fundamental principles that we've seen uh, on asset management clearly is, is the strategic leadership buy-in right at, at the highest levels, because that's where the culture starts in, in any organization. And I think that's critical to have the leadership buy-in. And then as you said, it's it's the devolution of the training, um, the support 
um, you know, what happens from there on in. Linda, I see you have your hand up. Perhaps you'd like to jump in there. Yeah, so I, I'd like to add to that, I think, because I think part of the question was potentially looking at um, how do we get more staff to implement asset management? And I would go back to what, um, to what our colleague uh, Mihaly just said, is that sometimes we have the solutions within. It's not going to be perfect, but if we have that awareness and we're, we're, we better know what we need to do, then um, you know, we won't be able to do everything with what we have. But if we were a little bit more efficient in how we do things, then that will deal with some of those staffing challenges. And then you know what you really do need in terms of new staff. It may be that you have enough to do the basics with what you have. You're just not doing it in the best way. Thank you. I think, uh, Christian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. So just building on what um, the, the last two um, responses have said, I, I do feel um, we, across the globe we face these challenges with, with training and, and, and capability and capacity for asset management. And I, and I do feel, I agree that we need to start it at the top. We need leadership to buy into this. We, we need to acknowledge that when an organisation comes together to deliver some level of service. It's the entire organization that's coming together. So this isn't about training one department. It's really about bringing all departments along on a common journey and recognizing that they all have to have a common understanding, at least the basics in place. Um, the IM, as has as, as been referenced in the question, you know, we do provide training services and that's something which you know, we've been very proud of. We've put that, that certificate and diploma out there um, and, and it's been very successful for us. I think the other thing though that we need to think about is, is the long term. Um, we need to think about how we are driving um, concepts of asset management into um, the, the broader educational institutions and, and not just in the courses which, you know, the engineering courses or what have you, but driving it into everything into everything, law, finance, you know, whatever else it might be, we need to drive this into every aspect of the educational uh, establishment because it's a, it's a problem that is not just resolved, as I said, by, by one community, it's resolved by many. I think, I think a very good point. I think it's that sensitization of the broader community of what, what asset management is, is all about. Um, just before I move off this question, uh, Sandra, I hope you don't mind, I might put you on the spot because I know I have some inside knowledge of the work that you did with LGD. Um, do you want to just give us a quick flavor of how the sort of training evolved in LGD and, and the impact that it had and, and how that developed within the organization, which might help with uh, Zaman's question? Thank you, Stefan. Uh, so we'll, I mentioned it during my presentation, but uh, we had this backbone. Uh, that it was the capacity building or professional development strategy through the whole implementation of the asset management and since the beginning. So how it worked in practical terms, it was, uh, as I mentioned, working with the senior leadership uh, to roll out several working groups in thematic areas. For example, uh, a working group for the strategic asset management plan, another one for asset, asset management plans, et cetera. And, and ensuring that those groups were representing different departments across the organization. Then those working groups uh, were the champions of asset management within LGED. And there were a, a range of, of senior, senior officials and, and mid officials. So they could also roll it out at different levels within the organization. And then linking that with training and officializing the training to get that sense of uh, proudness, but also to get a very good understanding of what asset management is. So we, we accompany all the officials through the training of the Institute of Asset Management, and we actually got around 20 uh, officials certified uh, in asset management. So then we mix that with a TOT, a training of training approach. So those champions are rolling out now uh, the further understanding and, and the long-term understanding of asset management within LGAD. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Um, I'm gonna move on to, to the next question. And I think, uh, Nick, if you're still with us, this is probably one for you. Uh, it comes from Yusuf Abdel Mohammed from FAO. And the question is, 
poor quality of workmanship due to weak planning, design and implementation capacity, as well as the low attention given to these aspects by governments and even some donors in sub-Saharan Africa is making infrastructure asset management uh, very challenging. Now the question is any thoughts and what contributions UNOPS envisages to make to address these quality management related crucial challenges of infrastructure development? Um, I believe Nick has stepped away. I know the question was addressed to UNOPS, but if any of our other panelists would like to make any comment, perhaps not specifically about what UNOPS can do, but in general, how do we address these challenges of, of quality management um, in infrastructure development, which I think is very pertinent in the world of asset management. Anyone wish to try and address that? Um, I, I can take a stab at it. It, um, it, it, is, uh, it is a real challenge. And I think part of that then comes back to uh, having processes in place um, throughout, your, um, throughout your, uh, your construction and project delivery, uh, where you've got quality assurance and quality control in place, where you have templates and checklists that, um, um, that the work is being monitored. And it certainly is, it, it is very hands-on. It doesn't mean you have to assess every single thing but um, you know you need to do that that random observation about what is happening as the infrastructure is being built. Um, it goes. Uh, it also goes to making sure that you don't cut corners and find that, that perhaps it's a cheaper way to do something. So it comes back to that planning, but also during that actual construction stage, physically having competent and qualified people on site to monitor and manage that project. And and part of that might even be project management training. Back to you, Stefan. Thank you, Linda. Um, and I see Mihai and Christian put their hands up. I'm not sure who was first, but uh, perhaps I'll just go with as I see it on the screen, Mihai, and then over to you, Christian. Uh, very quickly, uh, even in the US, uh, basically cities hire uh, specialized firms for uh, design if there is a need for a specific project or uh, construction, monitoring, and supervision. So these kind of things are, are important, even more important in Sub-Saharan Africa. I spent quite a bit of time, maybe 15, 20 years in, in Africa, different parts of mostly East Africa. So there is no capacity, then you need to insource a capacity. Uh, and uh, that is the second issue is, as I, I told, uh, Everything starts with the selection of good projects. If the project is 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 not good even at selection, there is no good engineering to to make it better. So uh, then, it need to be a, a strategic development and need time. So the cities need to understand that that sometimes a good project, a complex big infrastructure project, requires two years to to prepare. If they like to do it in six months, the results would be most likely uh, not good. Thank you. Stefan, just uh, building on building on what um, Michal said there, um, I, th I think it I think it absolutely comes down to what we've just discussed in the previous question, which is training and making sure that everybody throughout the throughout the um, the different different organizations involved with the capital program actually understand the, the, the contribution they're making to not just a successful project delivery, but delivering successful outcomes from, from the asset. So we, we have to make sure government understand the reasons why we need to be investing in quality, um, quality control at the, at, at the very early stage. So I think there's a training aspect. I think there's, you know, getting alignment around, around, um, uh, the understanding of those asset outcomes. I do think, um, as Michal said about the, the the US example he's just given there, you know, that across the globe we see organizations that bring in um, a, a third party to ensure that the goals and objectives of that project are being met, providing that oversight, very important. I think that, that is essential here as well um i think that i think generally speaking capital projects is there's room for improvement um and, and and really focusing on program excellence at the at the 
that the quality standards uh, level is important. Um, I, I think as well, data drives some of this. You know, we've got to start capturing more information, creating that digital twin, um, and 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 using that to drive the sort of handoff of projects as well as the successful delivery of projects as well. Um, but it, ultimately, it's an education thing. Let's make sure people understand what they're contributing to um, as we move forward. Thank you, Christian. Um, and I think just, you know, in the question, there was a point about donors, and I think it sort of touches on the point you made about the broader sensitization and the understanding of asset management. And perhaps, you know, if I, if I momentarily put on my UNOPS hat, I think sometimes we, we are not that great at explaining this to the donors and engaging with them well, uh, in, in terms of the importance of, of proper asset management, you know, and investing in this um, yeah. when, when we do infrastructure projects. I mentioned in my opening remarks about shovel-worthy projects, and I think that's that that's important for this. You know, we we've always very much focused on shovel-ready projects. We've got a project; it's sort of roughly outlined. Let's get on and build it, and that tends to then lead to the challenges you've got here around poor quality workmanship, etc. Because we're focused on getting that project delivered quickly, cheaply. Once we start focusing on shovel-worthy projects, we're not so much focused on the building the asset we're focused on delivering something and 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 that something then has a different level of performance metrics associated to it that that we can monitor throughout the life cycle of that asset including the design the procurement and the construction stages um we have, we have about 10 minutes left a few more questions but please just go ahead one, one short comment to this, basically. Uh, all the textbooks, in, including this uh, UN uh, uh, very valuable uh, book on infrastructure asset management, start and emphasize that uh, asset management means uh, selecting, uh, procuring, developing, uh, operating, maintaining, and final disposition of assets. This is the definition. In practice, in many countries in the development world, uh, instead they use two different uh, uh, leaply approach. One is an engineering, which means if we need something, we, we design and do. And without taking into account the sustainability, the financing, the, the need of the people, and so on. In one of the city in Kenya, the, the most successful project is the whatever the governor uh, proposed. All the rest are uh, half, half done. So this is not the way. The second uh, the pure approach is that there are no even asset management team in, in assigned in a, in a or a, an accountant in assigned as a, uh, he is the asset manager which means they believe that asset management is only accounting. So there are these. So what we need to really promote the whole full life cycle from selection to the final disposal. This is what missing and this is why there is no strategic approach on asset management. Thank you. Thank you, Mihai. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna try and get through all the questions. So the next one, uh, it's probably more of a comment, but uh, maybe a question that one of the panelists would like to tackle from Mohan Prasad Dakal at DESA. If we support LDC's accrual accounting system, the financial position will reflect asset values. Then it will lead to all required asset data, use of data on operations and maintenance. This will link to important. This will link to important information on expenses and revenue as well. Um, I'm not an expert in finance. Mihai, is there something you may have an opinion on? Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, the trouble is there is an enthusiasm uh, among donors, particularly about introducing accrual accounting system. I'm a trained accountant uh, myself, so I know the gravity. Uh, the point is that very often what I see on the field is a typical, so to speak, garbage in, garbage out. So the echo accounting system is an accounting system and as good as the data you put in. In many cases, if you don't have asset data, reliable, complete, consistent, then, then the echo accounting doesn't help. The same way as I, I kept telling, I seen echo accounting and cash-based accounting reporting systems in which 
basically the classification is either not there or not followed. So if there is no classification to show what is the amount spent on repair and maintenance, or, or for instance, they say, what are the liabilities spent? As I said, uh, the electricity bill, which is huge for water companies, uh, are paid just as a general expenses the uh, accurate accounting system that does not help. So my point is accurate accounting is indeed better, but it does not help if the data we put in are not good, not reliable, not well understood. Thank you. Okay, th thank you, Mihai. I'm gonna move on to the next question from Iftikhar Ahmed from UNOPS. Asset management is a long-term journey but the policymakers want immediate results. So any thoughts from the panel on how do we address this tension or conflict of a long-term journey, but sometimes even senior management want immediate results? Christian. I'd maybe, um, I'd maybe start by challenging what the immediate result uh, needs to be. Um, I think what with all the work that I've done over the years, I've seen I've seen um, returns on investment of major transformation programs in, in quite short spaces of time, actually. Um, and, and but it's about how you measure those results and that return on investment. So it's not always about necessarily a significant cost saving from um, from managing the assets. Sometimes it can be about driving safety. It's about reducing outages it can be very small things and, and actually some of the stuff that um nick o'regan was talking about before about um the healthcare aspects um the, the sort of social well-being aspects of providing safe reliable infrastructure for 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 women and children i mean i think i think that in itself um if we can place a value on that and um, that in itself can be achieved in very short order Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I... One thing, basically, this this is uh, against the strategic asset management. Uh, basically, this the strategic asset management is a constant battle between political driven uh, project selection and development and and uh, so to speak uh, information based uh, <clears throat> strategic one. And in Turkey, we try to uh, propose. Uh, uh, five-year five capital improvement planning. And the reaction was that we don't want to commit uh, beyond the political cycle. So we, we like to talk about until the next three years when the new election is coming, but we, we don't want to say five years because we don't know what happens after the new election. This is completely wrong, of course. And even we try to convince them that you guys Two, uh, two, two cases. If you really have a plan five years and beyond the, the, the next uh, election, first, you have a strong message to the people that this is what you like to do. And if you wish, if you win, you can continue. If you're not, you still have uh, your program on the plate when the election is coming. So uh, one of the things is that, that uh, very difficult to turn down the political ambition of that. So I would not try to think of how to comfort uh, uh, political leaders who like immediate results. Uh, within immediate results, uh, you need uh, technicalities, which, which is impossible to do. Thank you, Mihai. Linda, you did have your hand up. Do you still want to I say did. something? It was just very briefly to, uh, to reinforce what Christian said, is that um, um, what do results mean and what do they look like? At, uh, at, and what does that measurement, what does, what does that look like to you? What are you after? Because if we don't understand that, then um, we, we could be we're at cross purposes. Mm. And, it, uh, and, and so few projects, so few organizations really do a good job of defining what, how they're going to measure that performance and what it is. And I think that's, uh, that's fundamental. So perhaps that's something, you know, when an organization starts out on sort of what we call the asset management journey and wants to reshape the way they manage the infrastructure portfolio, um, they need to understand what, how are they going to measure the impacts and the success, um, you know, and, and the sort of return on investment in this and the time scales involved. You know, there, there are no perhaps quick fixes, but it does take time to, to do this. Um, 
we, we're almost on time. And there is one more question, um, or a couple more, but I think we will only have time for one more from Lloyd Washita from Crystal Partners, which I thought is quite important. How important is the involvement of private sector in the delivery of asset management and sustainable projects? Sandra, you had your hand up. Thanks, Stefan. I don't know if I have my hand up or I'm clapping in any case. <laughs> uh, I think it's very, very important to bring private sector uh, into our projects. Uh, they, they are well ahead uh, in the asset management journey. And in our case, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, we've, we've partnered with private sector to to ensure that lesson learns and, and good practices are shared with development partners. But uh, always, of course, keeping in mind that it's very important to also contextualize those best practices and lesson learns to, to work with to our projects so they can be sustained in time. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. And Christian, I think I'll give you the last word on this because I think we are out of time. So just very quickly, I, I also agree, I think it's important to bring in the private sector. They're incentivized differently. They've got access to different tools and techniques. Um, they've got access to different levels of resource and they think about things slightly differently. And I think from a government agency point of view, having that, just that rich mix of ideas about how you can move forwards and, and drive asset management to achieve those successful outcomes of your assets, it's important to tap into every and all knowledge that is available to you. So yes, absolutely embrace private sector as indeed embrace, you know, the, the third sector as well with the United Nations and everybody else. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, everybody. I'm going to, to close the session there because I believe our, our time is up, but I really want to A, thank our panelists so much for your interventions, for your wonderful insights, for the, for the engaging discussion for the audience and all those that participated. Um, you know, this is a huge topic. Um, there's a lot to it. I just hope that, you know, if you've just started out on this journey, that it's given you inspiration. If you're in the journey, that you have found other people you can connect with um, and that you can actually improve and increase your knowledge. And then lastly, obviously, thanks very much to Dessa and the colleagues at UNOPS for, for organizing this session. Uh, it's been a great privilege for me to, to facilitate this with, as I said, a great panel, uh, some very interesting questions and discussions. So I'm going to close the session. Um, I think there will be a recording made available uh, and we will share questions. And I believe there are a whole lot of links to information put in the chat, which I'll ask our UNOPS colleagues to, to share as well with everybody. So Take care, everybody. Have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much for, for sharing in this session with us. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Inos. Thank you, Indesa. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank goodbye, you. everybody. Thanks and thank goodbye. You from Uganda.